bring us up to that. I want us to be reminded that we probably, in fact, we do have more knowledge in the New Testament of that one church in Ephesus than we do any other church over a long period of years, approximately 40 years. We first come across the gospel going into Ephesus in Apollos' work, and he knew only at that time the baptism of John, and because of that, Aquila and Priscilla, having heard him preach, took him aside, taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly. But when Paul came to Ephesus, he found out there were those that had heard Apollos, and thus they only knew what Apollos could teach them. And that was before he knew the way of the Lord more perfectly. And thus, without going through the details, Paul asked them a question that told him what they knew and what they didn't know and then taught them the completeness of the gospel and they were baptized into Christ and thus the church started there. And much is said about the early church then in that passage. Then we have, of course, the letter known as the letter to the Ephesians, remembering that most of the New Testament is written to members of the church. Thus, it has to do with their living the Christian life, being righteous in Christ. And then when we close out many years later, the book of Revelation, John writes a letter, one of the seven churches of Asia, to Ephesus, and we see the state of the church at that time there. And that covers a, a lot of time, from the time of its establishment, the time of the writing of the book of Ephesians, then to the time that that letter in Revelation was written. Now, if you will, let's go to Ephesians, and I'm going to spend most of my time in the second chapter, but I want to lead up to that chapter by noticing some things that are important to our understanding of this letter that makes up all these letters written to members of the church to help them be faithful to God. That's the only reason that we have most of the letters of the New Testament is to help us remain faithful in Christ. Now, I've used that term, in Christ, and a casual reading of the book of Ephesians will cause you to see that in Christ is used over and over again. But you'll notice that in the beginning, chapter 1, that Paul announces who he is, and then he pronounces a blessing in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now watch. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. It's important to understand that immediately... He says, this is for you that you might be able to be faithful who have obeyed the gospel. You're in Christ. Remember, Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia that they were, based upon their faith, baptized into Christ. And thus these, seeing there is but one gospel, the power of God to save, Romans 1.16 and uh, these Ephesians heard that gospel, Acts 19, then they were also baptized into Christ, as is the case with all who are in Christ. For there is no other doorway into Christ but for the believing, penitent person to be baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ into Christ for the remission or forgiveness of sins. Thus, this letter is addressed to people like that. And if you look in verse 7, notice how he reminds them, in whom, the whom being Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And notice, it's according to the riches of his grace, the riches of his favor. He has favored us. We didn't deserve it. We can't earn it. He has favored us, and it's the gospel that is preached to every creature that announces to us that God has favored us and gives us in that gospel, remember it's the power of God to save us, the terms of salvation. That is the way 
that we express our confidence, our trust, our belief, our faith in God in obedience or compliance with these terms of pardon that God's favor has given us. Now, as you go on through chapter 1, as he sets up things, and remember these were, there were no chapters and verses in the original letters, but as we have it today, notice what he says in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now you hear a lot today about people talking about trusting in Christ. And the way they define that is, is that mentally you assent to the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the only Savior, and you're a sinner, and you need him, and you can't be saved without him, and you ask him to, to save you. And that's the concept that the denominational world has of trusting in Christ. But now we've already seen, when you take the totality of the information from the New Testament regarding becoming a Christian, and when one's sins are forgiven, that that's when the believing, penitent person is immersed in water for the remission of sins. Thus, it's by the authority of Christ, Acts 2 and verse 38 and verse 47. Notice, in whom ye also trusted, but when, verse 13, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Notice again, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know, God didn't just say, here's a word, um, and have the preacher say that's God's word. God proved that his word was from heaven and not from men. How was he going to do it? Well, that would get us into a complete discussion of the design, purpose, and end of miracles. That is, the miracles the apostles worked in the nine miraculous gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12 that were in the church through the laying on of the apostles' hands before the New Testament was fully revealed and written down and thus completed. Thus, the earnest of our salvation is seen by the Spirit's work among men at that time. If you ask me about the Bible being from God and not from man, I will show you that it was confirmed to be from God and not from man by the miracle signs and wonders that the apostles and prophets worked. That would be one of the signs of Christ being the Son of God is the miracles that he worked, John 20, 30, and 31. So this was the earnest of our inheritance. Look, if you can't prove the Bible to be the Word of God, then nothing we do amounts to anything. You can't have any assurance. You can't know anything. And Ephesians 6, 17, later in this very book, in putting on the whole armor of God, he will announce, and that's the Holy Spirit through Paul doing it, that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's the instrument the Spirit uses to convict one of sin, convert one to Christ, and to make him a Christian. Now, if you go on through here, you'll see he says down here in verse 19 and 20, again, talking about Christ, who is the first and the center and the core and the underlying principle of everything that has to do with God's love for us and our salvation. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ. Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14 is 6. So it is in Christ that salvation is worked. Notice, and he specifies when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. You go back and read the first recorded gospel sermon on the day the church began in Jerusalem in Acts 2, and you'll find out that Peter declared, along with the rest of the apostles, that Christ was sitting and ruling at the right hand of God. And if you look at Acts 4.12, there is no other name uh, given among men whereby we must be saved. You can't be saved by just anybody. It's not just a matter of a warm, kind feeling in your heart toward something that sanctifies it. 
It is the authorization of the will of Christ and the word of Christ that sanctifies it. And thus we seek to do only that which the Lord has authorized in his word, Colossians 3.17. Notice that God has placed him far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Now notice all of this is leading us up to chapter 2 and watch what he says about the church. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. What is that church? Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, I don't know what all that last part means. But if you are a Christian, then you are a member of the church Jesus built. You have been forgiven of your sins by the blood Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. You contacted that blood as a penitent believer when you were baptized into the death of of Christ, and you became a new creature when you were raised up from that watery grave of baptism, Romans 6, 3 and 4, sins forgiven, added to the church by the Lord himself, and in that church, as we read earlier, to live a holy life, which these letters of the New Testament are primarily written to teach us how to do. But we learn much from these two verses. He's put all things under his feet. In fact, in the Greek grammar, it would be because he's put everything under his feet. It's only logically to put the church under his feet as far as his authority. He's the head of all things of the church. People who say, well, we have a head of the church in Utah, or we have a head of the church in Rome, or we have headquarters on this earth. No, not if you follow the teachings of Christ in the New Testament. There is but one head of the church. And that's Jesus Christ. And he reigns at the right hand of God in heaven and has been since the apostles inspired of the Holy Spirit declared him so to be in Acts chapter 2 when the church was established. Then he says that body is his church. Well, later in chapter 4, he's going to say there's one body. Well, he defines right here for you what that body is, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Again, I say I don't know what all that means, but I know that as a member of the church, I'm a part of that which fills all in all. Now, you tell me what all in all is. I don't know, but it's highly significant. It's an important point that Paul is driving home to urge every Christian to be as godly as you possibly can be in the church, to follow the authority of Christ in living a righteous life. You see, it's very important to become a Christian that's the way you get rid of all past sins, the sins that first alienated you from God. But once you're in Christ, you're a new creature, and then you have to learn how to live in Christ. And so these letters, as we've said several times, are written. Now to chapter 2, after that little bit lengthy introduction. Notice, there's an and here. It's a coordinating conjunction. He's going to continue on with important matters in what we have as chapter 2 as he had started in chapter 1. And you, and here I say, you who, what you, members of the church. Well, you have here in the King James Version three words following in you, and they were supplied by the translators to make it fit better our way of saying things in the English language. And you hath he quickened. Quickened mean he's made alive. Well, in what sense? Not physically. But you're alive toward God in Christ spiritually. Now, you were dead. Death means separation. How were you separated from God before you became a Christian? Well, it was in trespasses and sins. Sins, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Romans 3.23 say all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death or separation from God. Now notice he reminds them of what they used to be when they were in that alienated state. He says wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Brethren, there is a course of this world. Some of us in the church tend to revert back to the course of this world. Have you ever driven down a road that was kind of muddy and there had been several vehicles ahead of you? 
and you were trying to stay out of the ruts because that's where it's gotten so soft and the tires are spun so much, you can get stuck very easy in those ruts. So you try to straddle them or you try to go around them lest you go according to the course of those that made the ruts and will get you stuck. And so right here he's saying there is a course to this world. And this letter is one of the letters of the New Testament it says stay out of the ruts. You've got to follow another course. If not, you'll get stuck right back in the same mess you were in before you ever heard the gospel. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Well, now that prince of the power of the air is simply meaning old Satan. He goeth about, Peter tells us, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Well, he has those in the world. They're still lost in sin. They're going to hell. He doesn't have to worry about them from the standpoint of trying to get them. He's got them. They're in the rut. They're going according to the course of this world. And they're going to end up in eternal destruction. Paul doesn't want that and God doesn't want that. Most of the New Testament's written to Christians to keep us out of the ways of the world. That is governed by the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. What is that spirit that now works in the spirit of disobedience? It's a state of mind. It's an attitude. It's a viewpoint. It's a way of life. John deals with it in a commentary on this in 1 John. When he tells us not to walk according to this world. And he tells us what he means by world. He means the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And he tells us that if we live on that level and that's all life means to us, then we're going to be destroyed eternally. Just go over and read what's said in detail, and that's a divine commentary on the children of disobedience and the spirit that now worketh in them. And that's most of the world. Folks, this is written to say, don't tolerate that in members of the church. It's written to each member saying, you don't tolerate, first of all, that in your own life. When thoughts contrary to the will of heaven cross your mind, you have the obligation to know the Bible well enough to recognize they are contrary to the truth. And you, if you please, you kick them out. You get rid of them. You confess that you've had the thoughts and ask God's forgiveness. And then you draw nigh out of God by knowing his word and be more determined than ever to abide by the authority of Christ and his word. He said now of these people Concerning the former life these Ephesians had lived, if you go back over and read Acts 19, you get a good idea of that. Among whom also we all had our conversation or our manner of life or our conduct or the way we lived in times past. In the lust of our flesh. Well, that ties in with what I said a moment ago when John talks about that. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh. People of this world are just that, of this world. They don't think about death and dying and the judgment and eternal damnation or a heaven or a hell. If they do have the viewpoint of a heaven, then, you know, everybody goes. I've never seen an obituary yet or no matter how terrible a Hollywood character was in his life that when they die or run over or die of overdose of drugs, somebody says, rest in peace. That is the most horrific thing in the world that blinds people that you must live a certain kind of life on this earth before you can rest in peace. And it's the life written down in the Bible and more precisely the life of living a godly life as is set out here. Notice again the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and all the mind. There's where it begins, in the mind. What do you focus on? What do you think about? What do you plan to do? What do you want to do with your life? How are you trying to shape your life, folks? It all begins in the mind. And from the mind, we make our choices as to what we will do. And that's the reason there's going to be a final judgment where everybody gives an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. I'm a free moral agent. I have free will. I make the choices of what I'm going to do with my life. 
And if that's not the case, why do we have a New Testament, most of which is written to those who are redeemed, who are in the church, but yet how to live a faithful Christian life? Now notice what the situation of these people are as they live according to this course, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. By nature here doesn't mean that they inherited Adam's original sin, and thus there was nothing they could do about it. They were born into this world, depraved, and they had no choice, and they're inclined to no good thing at all. Oh, no, no, that's a human doctrine called Calvinism. What it means is that they had, as Gentiles, practiced so many generations, so many hundreds of years, so many thousands of years, just read Romans chapter 1, doing these kind of evil things, it was just second nature to them. They didn't think anything about it. You don't think anything about today as you drive around, no matter how godly you are, as the Bible defines godliness, to see denominational churches all around, you don't think a thing in the world about it. It doesn't make them right because you don't think in anything about it. It's just the way things work in our society and culture. So we're not thinking that much about it. Well, these people, in the way they lived, in the horrendous things written about where they had uh, gone to in the depths of their depravity in Romans chapter 1, they just took that in stride. That was what they did. I think it's impossible for us today to understand the jarring, down to the core, impact that the gospel had on such people. They didn't have any concept of God and Christ and the Bible. The only few that had any kind of correct concept of God were the Jews, and they were very much in the minority. That world was governed by a way and a means that we can't fathom, but they took it for granting, and so he says it's by nature the children of wrath. That's where you were headed. Again, I cite Romans 1. But notice in contrast, that's the way it works in this life. People without the Bible or care about God or God's Word, that's what happens. But God, now watch how he describes him, who is rich in mercy and uh, for his great love wherewith he loved us. That sounds like John 3, 16, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, notice should not, but have everlasting life. Well, he's reminding them of the mess they were in because it was just natural due to long practice sin for them to be there. But God didn't let that drive him away from them. They were still in souls made in his own image. And thus, he loved them and cared for them. Even while they were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God, who's rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even, emphasis is made here, even when we were dead in sins. When you think about the men who crucified Christ, and you think about the fact that they cast lots of what little he had so they could divide it up among them, then they took that outer garment and they wouldn't tear it into four parts. They, it was woven from all the way through with one seam. So rather than do that, they cast lots to see who got the whole thing. Now, have you ever considered the fact of they're at the foot of the cross doing that? And what have they just done to the man on the cross and the other two men crucified with him? Does that tell you something about the disposition of mind and the hardness of those people of that time? They didn't uh, mind doing what they did to Christ, but they were concerned over a piece of material and they wouldn't want to tear it up. So they cast lots so he would get the whole thing. So even when we were dead in sins and quickened or made alive spiritually, notice he quickened us together with Christ. And then he says, by grace or favor, he favored you. You're saved from your sins. We do well to remember that when you speak of God's grace, that God has done for us what we never could do for ourselves. There's no way that we could do what Christ did, nor love like Christ loved, nor love like the Father did to give to Christ. There's no way that we could even have the Word of God in our hands today without God in His favor giving it to us 
and guaranteeing it to be infallible by the Holy Spirit that guided the writers of it not to make a mistake. We couldn't do it, but he could. He did it for us, but here's what we can do. We can read these letters and honestly view them and look at our lives, and we can bring our lives in subjection to the teachings of them. Paul knows that. He's already preached the gospel to them that brought them out of this kind of life that he's just described. And he knows they can learn more about growing up in Christ and being more spiritual. Even when we were dead and sins hath quickened us together with Christ. If Christ hadn't gone through what he did in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, there would be no together with Christ. There would be nothing like that. But because Christ blazed the trail, as it were, for us, then we, through belief and obedience to his gospel, can have remission of sins. And in Christ, the church, the one body of Christ, we can grow up, if we will, use our time in Christ to the proper study and practice of his word. Notice he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I don't know that we realize how God views us sometimes, but here's a, here's a peek at it right here. He sees those who are faithful members of the church as being raised up to set in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now let me ask you something. How many people in this world today of over, what, I don't know, six billion people, how many occupy these positions? There are very few. And what a privilege it is and what a duty comes with that privilege for us to realize about ourselves how special we are in God's sight. The church is the family of God, 1 Timothy 3.15. You are God's children. Now, are your children special to you? Well, then how much more so are we spiritual children of God? Look what it costs God to bring us into existence with Christ. Notice that this is done... But we don't know about these ages to come once material, physical things end and time is no more. But here's exactly what is said by the Holy Spirit to us. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I'll tell you one thing. I don't understand what all that means after this age is gone and is the ages roll in eternity. But I want to experience it. And you know I want to experience it more than anything else there is on this earth or anywhere else. And I know that means I must dedicate myself to the knowledge of the truth and in all honesty to live it, to teach it, and defend it. Because I have none of this without the truth of Christ. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John chapter 8, 31 and 32. And of course, verse 17 of chapter 17, he said, Father, as he prayed to God, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But now watch what he says. For by grace are you saved. Now people will say you're saved by grace alone. But he says you're saved by God's favor, but it's through faith. And that not of yourself. You didn't do it. You didn't care about God. You are busy about taking care of things of this world as you saw fit. But he cared about you. We need to remember that the whole gospel plan of salvation, along with the Bible, is a gift from God that we don't deserve and cannot merit. And in that book, Divine, comes the message of salvation and the terms of pardon that show our faith in God's system of salvation, which terms we gladly meet, and in Christ we gladly follow the teachings of Christ on being faithful. Notice he's making it clear you can't boast about any of this. Verse 9, not of works lest any man should boast. Notice he's already said we've been raised up together with Christ. Now look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. I'm created in Christ because of my belief and obedience to the gospel of God's power to save me, Romans 1.16. I have nothing to glory of. I simply understand the truth and exercise my mind to know the Bible is the Word of God 
and to prove that it is 1 Thessalonians 5.21 and that what the gospel is, God makes it clear, I've given this for your understanding. Paul will say in verse 4 of chapter 3 concerning his life in Christ, how that in verse 3 too, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a foreign few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul, what did you believe about him? Read my writings. And you'll know what my beliefs are. That's what he's saying. So he knew we could know this. So we're his workmanship. How we created in Christ Jesus. But a person must obey the gospel to get into Christ Jesus. To be made a new creature in Christ. But that creature in Christ is created unto good works. How do I know what a good work is? Because I can read my Bible and know what God said a good work was. Such as James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans in their affliction and keep oneself unspotted from the world. All these letters written to Christians ought to remind us in whatever way that we need to have it in your personal life to keep yourself unspotted from the world, to not be tainted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Wherefore, remember, I'm glad we can remember, and thus that tells me, this is not the first time you've heard this, Ephesians. Wherefore, in the light of what I've just said and reasoning correctly with it, and the conclusion we're drawing, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, that is by Jews, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were, and this is the state of all people outside of Christ today, you're without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. If you're not a Christian, that's your state right now. And if you were to die in that state, there is no hope for you whatsoever because salvation is wrought in Christ and one must be baptized into Christ. And live as the New Testament says. Look what he then says. He doesn't leave them here. Because as I said in the beginning. He's writing to the church. They've heard the gospel. But now in Christ Jesus. Notice. But now where? In Christ Jesus. Speaks of them how they used to be. Who sometimes were far off. You're made near. By the blood of Christ. Well, you contacted that blood when you were baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And you have the marvelous statement said by John again in 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in the flesh the enmity or hate even the law of commandments contained in ordinance for to make in himself of twain or two one new man so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the hate or enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were near. That is Gentiles and Jews. They can all be one now. By Christ and his gospel. And believing the same thing. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore. You are no more strangers. And foreigners. Well then what are you? If you have escaped those things. Why, you're fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. In 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul said to Timothy, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Brethren, dearly beloved, what we need mostly today as far as the church is concerned 
as Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 3.15, that we might know how to behave ourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now watch, in whom all the building, that's the church, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy, a dedicated temple, and it's done in the Lord because we abide by the Lord's will. And we close out, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Will you receive the message of the Spirit declaring the will of Christ concerning God's way of salvation? Will you as a member of the church govern yourself according to the teachings of Christ in living a godly life in the church? Paul was greatly concerned about this. And as you read through your New Testament, most letters, as I've said several times, written to members of the church concerning being faithful, then you see what is the core and the undergirding of all these letters. If you're not a child of God this morning, I will not go back over what I've covered several times in the plan of salvation. It's God's plan. It's in the book divine. And you must believe it and obey it in being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. More than that, he does not ask you to do. Less than that, and you will die in your sins. As a child of God, where is your dedication? Are you determined to grow up in Christ? Are you determined to be more against this world and the spirit of power that is the devil that governs it through the flesh? We need to bolster ourselves up and realize we're not in some sort of country club, but we're in a fighting machine, the army of the Lord, to take the gospel to a lost and dying world and to work with ourselves to keep us pure. That should be our goal more than anything else in life. If you need to come to Christ, whether it's in repentance because you're a child of God and you sinned and you need to confess those sins and ask God to forgive you, or to become a Christian, then we invite you to do so now while we stand in.